の恋をする者の気持ちがわかるはずだねピ。And you should realize you're in the girl's bathroom, you little POS. But yeah, after covering a lot of the heyday of the latter half of the Heisei era of Precure, I guess it was about time we circled back to the OG. Now don't worry, we will get to Mahotsukai and maybe even give Kira Kira a proper overview eventually, but honestly, we just wanted to cover this series that's gonna be a little bit more well received, aka land us a few more views and comments. Gotta feed that their algorithm every chance we get! <laughs> With that in mind, though, what is there really to say about the series? I mean, we've covered a lot of its background in previous videos, and of course, other YouTubers have provided their own two cents, so what can we bring to the table for this series? Well, I think it is important to consider how much this series managed to shake up the genre, and no, we're not going to go into full clickbait mode, just hear me out here. First of all, let's just get this out of the way. Magical girl anime has always had a darker side to it. Sailor Moon is an obvious example, but even this franchise's quote unquote creator's previous work, Ojama Ajo Doremi, dealt with more mature themes too. Themes that I think some more modern series could stand to bring up more, but I digress. The point is that this franchise, or even Madoka Magica, didn't really change things up that much, they just ended up bringing it more to the forefront and into the hands of the normies who tried to change up the narrative. Hell, the latter series was more meant to be like Kamen Rider Ryuki in Magical Girl Skin. Though on that note... Genre redefining or not, I will say that this series did bring some much needed variety by just being its own brand of magical girls, or more specifically, toy magical girls. Yes, just like how you can recognize the aesthetic and ideological differences between DC and Marvel heroes, or at least before they all start to feel like they were coming off the same assembly line, Toy does have its own sense of sensibilities when designing their heroes. Much of it, of course, stemming from their own personal Stanley, the late great Shotaro Ishinomori, creator of Super Sentai and Kamen Rider. If you've seen our original Toy Trinity videos, then you'll know how much this franchise tries to maintain the unyielding heroic ideals of their big brother Tokusatsu, to the point that they do sometimes wholesale rip them off more than once. The point is that now that they were completely free to do their own magical girl anime rather than adapting someone else's work and make it more action oriented than their immediate predecessor franchise, they went all in. Did it pay off? Well, okay, obviously it did, but how well did it pay off? Well, let's take a look at the first 11 episodes of Itaiwa Precure and find out. The first episode wastes absolutely no time introducing our main heroines Nagisa Misumi and Hodoka Yukishiro. It's actually really well done, as through nothing but the characters going about their normal days, we're able to infer a lot about them. The dialogue is kept to an absolute minimum, with characters talking like they would in these situations, and no superfluous monologue or narrations to hype these girls up. We can just tell that they're highly respected by their peers, and therefore deserving of the attention of the audience. Interestingly though, while we could tell that these two girls tackled very different fields of brawn and brains respectively, they also seem to have equal determination and drive for their respective interests. Thus, through this last shot before the opening, we could read into the symbolism that these two not too dissimilar worlds would soon collide. Now you see, stuff like this is why I obsess over the importance of visual storytelling and subtext. Not only will it often impart more about a character than any words ever could, but it does it in a very efficient and quick manner. This whole prologue only lasted for about a minute and 17 seconds, and we already know all we need to about these two characters. Compare this with Yui Nagomi's introduction, where not only will we see the beginnings of a certain narrator who could never shut her trap, but we also got some very needless and kind of unnatural talks from Yui's teammates, expositing about her abilities and interests, and yeah, you know what? There is no comparison with the OG from almost two decades ago. This completely trumps it. In hindsight, we probably should have taken that as an early sign as to where this character wasn't going to go. And to think, we haven't even gotten to one of the most iconic openings of the genre. <laughs> 
probably one of the best examples of why first impressions really matter, to the point that this opening is still considered to be the best of the franchise. Personally, I don't subscribe to that belief in the same way that I think that the Power Rangers in Space opening is the best over the OG. That said, just like that opening, this one does understand the importance of the earworm factor, with something as simple and yet effective as saying the title of the show through multiple variations and tones. Combine that with a melody that's eternally hummable, and you get something that, while not on my personal pantheon of the best anime openings ever, is still a tune that's well remembered to this day. Day. Meanwhile, the visuals almost keep up with it. I mean, obviously, they include some of the most iconic visuals of the franchise they are still referenced to this day, especially during the first episodes of the main new series. That said, some of the middle and ending visuals don't exactly match with the beat or lyrics, and then there's this bit of Nagisa and Horika passing by each other, which is basically what we just saw in the prologue from a different angle. I mean, sure, it's an important moment, but not one that you have to use twice in the same opening with no variation. Don't get me wrong, I still think it's an amazing opening that, while not my personal favorite of the franchise, I do think it has some great tunes and lyrics that really get across the themes of the series really well that we'll discuss later. But yeah, I still really like it, so please put down your pitchforks. Also, if you want to hear my opinion about the ending theme, well, we already went into deep detail about it for the top 10 pre-cure ending themes list, so go check that out if you're interested. Anyway, the series truly began with our two main heroines being over a discussion about shooting stars, where they established further how much of a freaking bookworm Honoko was on top of being popular with the boys. Though Nagisa was also popular in a slightly different way. And thus, the ships of Yuri began to sail. But yeah, for the first part of this episode, they actually do a nice job subtly building both of these characters further, and even slowly start to form a bond with each other. Again, these are all good examples of visual storytelling and foreshadowing that lets the viewers piece things together rather than outright spelling it out for them. Then, when Nagisa tried to be less subtle with her desires, well, she got rightfully punished for her insolence. <laughs> Huh, did the headbutt being trope come later? <laughs> oh, there it is. But yeah, Nagisa had met both her fairy partner and transformation trinket in Meppo. No, oh, so this is what the Gokai Cellular was like before it hit puberty. At the same time, Honoka found her partner, Mippo, safely tucked away in a locked box, which, considering how much these things go for on eBay, yeah, I do the same thing. Anyway, right off the bat, the leader of Shocker demanded Nagisa take him to Mippo as the two were in a relationship. She agreed to do it just to shut him up, resulting in her taking all sorts of shortcuts through places that you really wouldn't be able to go through, especially post-2020. At least wear a mask in the kitchen, girl. But yeah, both girls ended up cooperating with their fairies and met at a closing amusement park. Though someone else was also there waiting for them. <sighs> Holy crap, David Bowie, what are you doing here? Also, you look a little different, but I can't quite put my finger on it. Okay, but seriously, Peace Artier was the first general of the franchise, and wasn't afraid to outright kill the two girls. Fortunately, they also brought with them some of the cards that came with their toys, I mean fairies, and we got an introduction to one of the main play mechanics of this show. Actually, this thing didn't really read cards, and you could probably slash any old piece of paper through it. No, it's more likely that they borrowed tech from a certain other show that happened to air about 30 minutes before it. Yeah, worth mentioning that this show came out the same year as the 5th Heisei Kamen Rider series, Blade, where most of the major toys had a legit card scanning mechanic. While I obviously don't own the original card commute, I'd more likely sell that thing, I do think that they use similar tech just based off of the similar barcodes they had. It's just an interesting little detail showing how interconnected Precure and Kamen Rider were even from day one. It also might explain how a Kenzaki eventually joined the roster. Anyway, Q stock transformation sequence that, yeah, even by today's standards, looks really damn good. 
helps that it's a really unique sequence by essentially having our main heroines briefly become T-1000s, which, needless to say, makes this whole thing pretty damn epic. Sure, it doesn't have as many dynamic camera angles as modern transformations, and is kind of seizure-inducing with that rainbow background, but I still gotta say, this is a pretty inspired transformation sequence that I almost feel like a few Rider series would even take some inspiration from. But yeah, for the first time, we got our titular superheroines of the franchise, complete with cheesy catchphrases. The nani? Can we please at least try to maintain the fourth wall today? But yeah, as the first fight of the franchise, they established a few more tropes, like the cures jumping a significantly high height, both as an early indicator of their strength, and for a bit of comedy to show them still adjusting to their sudden superpowers. More importantly though, the resulting fight with Pizard was pretty darn impressive with them dishing out and receiving some hard hits. Again, just because it's not quite as flashy as modern seasons, there is still a significant amount of impact to these hits, likely thanks to some good choices in sound effects and appropriate choreography. It's kind of like watching an old school WCW match, which speaking of which... And of course, we got our first monster of the week for this franchise in the form of the Zakenna. The name itself derived from the word Fuzakerna, which is Japanese for don't mess with me, though it is considered to be a little bit cruder, so it would be more like don't f with me. Thus, with a name like that, we got a pretty gnarly looking first enemy for this franchise when it possessed the roller coaster from Final Destination 3. It's also worth mentioning that this first episode's animation direction was handled by a veteran to this franchise and Sailor Moon, Katsumi Tamigai. They're very talented and honestly deserve a lot more work these days. I think the last thing they did for this franchise was this one bit of key animation from Delicious Party. Anyway, in spite of being pretty much on the ropes for much of this fight, the two superheroines matched the Fiat rather easily barely an inconvenient as soon as they launched their first finisher. We'll talk more about this later, but I will say this was at least an impressive looking attack, more so for the initial bombastic speech to deliver before launching their finishing blow. It again, right out of the gate, established the power levels of this OG team and how they could deal with any enemy. With that, Pisar retreated and the fairy couple reunited, ending a fairly effective opening episode to this franchise. Episode 2 opened with a brief recap of the last episode from Nagisa's perspective that yeah would be a thing throughout the show, though at least it was organically incorporated as of course she would want to organize her thoughts after her life started to go at 100 miles an hour with all the superheroine stuff. And just in case anyone tries to argue that the delicious party narrator isn't so bad because of this, let me just say... Nagisa is only doing this at the beginning of these episodes, so it's not nowhere near as intrusive as, say, a third-party narrator who has to explain every little thing. In short, this show isn't spoon-feeding its audience exposition every three seconds, and Grant can go suck it. Anyway, yeah, Nagisa's life had become a little more chaotic with the addition of a noisy little king of heroes. Wow, these new textbooks take things in much more radical directions than they did back in my day. This episode also saw the introduction of the big bad of the series, the Jark King. I wonder if he's related to the general. Then again, I don't remember that dude ever being this intimidating. Again, this show understands the importance of first impressions, so they made Jarky here as imposing as possible by using these pretty epic angles to get across that in spite of the clear distance apart, Bissar just looked minuscule compared to this guy. Combine that with the moving backgrounds of the Dotsuku zone that are clearly meant to be a dark counterpart to the pre backgrounds by having them be muddier and more polluted looking colors, and you can just tell this is the lair of the ultimate villain. Even the obvious early 2000 CGI made this dude and his mountain of change just look otherworldly. Again, I could rave for hours about the introduction of this villain and his world thanks to visuals that, yeah, still kind of hold up to this day. And while I know that these guys aren't going to be the most fleshed out antagonists of the franchise, why don't we ask Megamind what makes for a great supervillain? PRESENTATION! <laughs> Anyway, we also learned what Japanese Chernobog's goal was. No, dude, that's the other toy animation cash cow that they refused to put out to pasture already. Back with Nagisa, we learned a little bit more about their partners and yeah, pretty much how their toys worked. 
Basically, on top of using them to transform, they also had cards that held the spirits of their allies from their homeland, who for the purposes of their mission, had to take care of them, which yeah, I kinda feel bad for these cards. I mean, at least the undead could participate in some awesome finishers for the riders. She also learned a little bit more about her human partner and her interests. <laughs> They also ended up having a discussion about the pros and cons of containing the whole superheroine thing. Both girls brought up good points. Personally, I think Nagisa had the best point about not wanting to be off at a young age, but it was still an interesting conversation that was handled in a well-paced and sensible manner. We also got introduced to a supporting character, Shoko Fujimura. Piece of advice, kid. Don't even think about putting on a knockoff tuxedo mask costume. That's only gonna hurt you in the long run. At the same time, Pizarro was scoping out the city and giving us some useful exposition, including hinting at how the Zakena could easily be created thanks to the pent-up negative emotions of the modern society. Thank God this guy wasn't around during, well, really, any election. He also took note of the non-metaphysical energy created by fossil fuels and wanted to siphon some of it off to his king. As such, he went with really the most logical appliance to suck things up with. Hey, I was only kidding when I said this guy was like David Bowie. As a result, the scene went through a massive blackout that shot off stuff like traffic lights and elevators, including one that their classmates were stuck in. Thus, the Precure tried to prioritize saving them, but were intercepted by Pissard. This led to a fight with Zakenna that was pretty disjointed. I mean, not only was the animation pretty choppy, but I'm not even sure what Honoka was trying to do here. I think the implication was that she had thrown the monster, using its momentum against it, but it's just not all that well laid out. Based on his work on the Ojama Jodorain franchise, I blame this on the storyboarder Yasuo Yamayoshi. Maybe he's more to blame for all of that drag and drop animation than Mitsuru Oyama. Still, at least it was made up for by this awesome sequence of our heroines pulling a Spider-Man 2 to stop the elevator from falling. With that, they just defeated the giant vacuum cleaner after being on the ropes for most of the fight, but at least it led to a pretty brutal kill with Nagisa literally leaving her mark on the machine. Incident on a small island. To be believed or disbelieved. If either of these two entities walk onto your premises, you better hold their hand. The gentleman in question might try to pull you into the Twilight Zone. The third episode featured Nagisa being nominated to organize their class's social studies field trip by her mega hot teacher. I mean, Jesus lady, what sort of ballistics do you have equipped there? If anyone knows where that quote is from, then thank you. And let's try to keep it alive because Capcom certainly isn't. She also ended up getting paired up with Honoka, and I just love this really subtle little gag of everyone laying out a sigh of relief that they didn't have to work with Nagisa. It's leagues better than some of the more forced gags that unfortunately have been a thing in this franchise for the longest time now. <laughs> Hey look, the first shippers of this franchise. And don't worry, y'all are about to get a lot more company soon. To get themselves organized, they decided to hang out at Honoka's home, where we got to learn more about her family life, including her parents who were away, and conveniently blocked out in all of their photos so that the animators didn't have to come up with new designs. And when they needed a new design, they just went with some old standbys. <laughs> Hey, don't judge Nagisa. I'm sure Einstein is a great husband, though, to many. We also got some world building from the fairies that was also kind of covered in the previous episode, though at least here they clarified a few things, including what the Precure's roles were. To keep it short, they had to find the MacGuffins called the Prism Stones to save the fairies' world from Jarky. And again, I do appreciate when a show does much of its exposition early on and in a fairly competent manner. Nagisa also met Honoka's grandmother, who in the previous episode hinted at some cryptic stuff, but more importantly... Nagisa-san. Eh? Honoka wo yoroshiku ne? God, even the boomers are getting in on the ship. Anyway, Pissar decided to use some more covert methods of dealing with the Precure. He impersonated a student teacher, who I guess doesn't need to show any sort of verification, and managed to find his target, whilst also being targeted himself. <laughs> Lady, I'm gay. I thought you'd pick up on it. 
But yeah, he ends up using some more of that boy magic on the previous teacher to lure Nagisa out. <laughs> Fortunately, they managed to save her because this dude doesn't know how to multitask. This led into, thankfully, a much better fight than the last episode, as not only was it well animated thanks to the franchise vet Toshie Kawamura providing her first of many contributions to this franchise, but there was also the added danger and drama of our heroines need to protect their still high as a kite teacher. The Zakena also provides, objectively, one of the strongest monsters of the week of the franchise, as it managed to possess every item in the gymnasium. With that much of a field and power advantage, it managed to really push the still newbie heroine to the edge, and they just as quickly pulled out their finisher for the instant win condition again. So yeah, for at least these first three episodes, they do suffer from some unsatisfying fight conclusions. I mean, if I had watched this back in the day with my current mindset, it would still pass the three episode test, as the world and character building has been handled really well, and ultimately the fights were still good with some pretty intense action, just weak send-offs. To at least give them our mind series credit, they at least ended their fights after they managed to turn things around in some way. The following episode featured the aforementioned field trip, which was basically a standard trip to the museum at first. And one of the big takeaways would end up being the works of some Van Gogh-esque artist described by this girl with Nagisa's hair. <laughs> Ah, ain't that cute? I mean, you seem like such a nice girl, just like the Nomura chick in the bushes. Meanwhile, Pissard was given an ultimatum from his boss, which, yeah, come on, Jarky, it's only the fourth episode, dude. We all know nothing's gonna happen to the first general of this franchise. I mean, come on, you haven't even introduced this show's other guys, and oh wait, oh yeah, you're totally dead, dude. And yeah, more on these characters later. Meanwhile, at the museum, our heroine's cell phones literally near the room. <laughs> oh, come on, dude. We all know you can do a better love love than that. Nikisa tried to make sure they didn't break anything, only to end up breaking a very brittle statue. Yeah, if anything, this museum needs better security. This is how y'all end up with paintings covered in canned soup. She, of course, tried to fix it and made something. <laughs> Eh, just put this underneath it, and you should be good. Fortunately, this is also the gallery of plot relevancy, as they found the foreshadowed painting by Mario Piccarini, sponsored by Nintendo. But yeah, apparently he had painted it after somehow surviving getting hit by a shooting star that turned out to be Mippo in 1904. Yeah, this was actually a really interesting development that added a lot of intrigue to this little fairy that looked like a device that wouldn't be invented for almost a whole century. Meppo also revealed that the passing of that century was more like a day for him when following his partner as they escaped from their invaded kingdom. So yeah, the show is bringing in time dilation, which I always find to be a fascinating storytelling element when it's not just used as a means of streamlining a training arc. Anyway, Peace Art launched an attack where... Uh, dude, did you always have that power? Yeah, you know, maybe Jarky was right to want to kill you off if you couldn't take out the Precure like that from the very beginning. Hell, the only reason the two managed to escape getting Stone World was out of pure luck as they had gone to look for Nagisa's fangirl. And of course, said fangirl ended up getting mistaken for her. Cornered and likely unable to use his petrification stare from a distance, Pissard of course broke out the Zakenna that managed to possess the whole museum. Seriously, these monsters of the week are broken. And again, even though the animation wasn't the best, the fact that our heroines were basically taking part in an action anime version of Night of the Museum more than made up for it. It only got more exciting when he turned all of the petrified humans into a statue hurricane that they couldn't attack. Seriously, we're only on the fourth episode, and this is all pretty damn epic, and very thankfully, they didn't just resolve things with their finisher again. I mean, of course they used it, but at least there was a little more in between, like... Use the force, Luke. Hey, still better than anything from the sequel trilogy. With that, the day was saved, the fangirl managed to leave her mark on her favorite painting, and Nakisa managed to create a new form of art.
The fifth episode opened with more of this little overprivileged sprite and his selfish antics. <laughs> well, okay, and hey, to save some of your valuable time, why don't I cook those noodles directly in your mouth? We also got a better look at the generals of this series, Poisony, Ikubo, Kiya, and Geki Drago. I must break you. Seriously, were the writers of the show just like some big fans of 80s American films? Because if that's the case, y'all have some awesome taste. But yeah, Pissard was on his last legs with even his cohorts dissing him. Back with Nagisa, she was helping her partner see his quote-unquote future wife, and yeah, girl, you're right for not taking any romantic advice from this fedora-twirling nice guy. Moreover, I'm pretty sure much of the early fandom was already shipping you two. Though unfortunately, there were some others of Meppo's ilk. <laughs> Yeah, some parts of the show haven't aged as well as others. Thankfully, this led to an awesome moment where, ironically, the girly Honoka was a lot more assertive than the tomboy Nagisa. It's a really nice subtle bit of characterization through subversion that we'll see throughout the series. Anyway, they got some takoyaki from one of their school's alumni, Akane Fujita, who Nagisa gave her whole backstory of in Not So Self a Matter. Not really complaining, mind you, as she will be a recurring character, especially in the following season, so it's probably better to establish this stuff sooner rather than later. But yeah, much of this episode became a not-at-all-subtle date between the two superheroines that was cute, helped by the characters having some actually really good chemistry that makes you understand how this franchise was pretty much built off of these undertones that sometimes just become full-on overtones. However, the two, while on friendly terms, weren't that close, so understandably, Nagisa, especially after that earlier outburst, felt like they were from different worlds. And this angsting couldn't have come at a worse time as a certain walking fro had found her partner. Pissard also revealed his motivations for working for his king and yeah, you know dude, you're kind of raising your flags when you start talking about living forever. <laughs> oh come on dude, you're not even trying to survive if you're not even going to use a road roller correctly. Really? I don't even think Nagisa needed to show up as this guy probably would have self-destructed or something, but whatever. <laughs> anyway, after pretty much assuring our heroine's victory with some overly dramatic speeches and giving back Honoka's transformation trinket, god the cliches are strong with this one, the precure I think had a fight with Bissard? <laughs> Um, I'm sorry, I think I blinked there. Uh, what just happened? Okay, Honoka rushed in to cover Nagisa, and then Pissard went flying, and wait, what? Yeah, unfortunately, this was another fight brought down by some pretty shoddy storyboarding. I mean, sure, animation can be a subjective quantifier, but when it feels like whole sequences are just plain missing, then yeah, that's not a good look for your still-fledgling series. This was especially disappointing as, yeah, this was Pissard's final battle, and unfortunately again, our heroines were on the ropes, and yet as soon as they pulled out their finisher, they had already achieved their win condition. And yet, I won't say this fight was outright bad. I mean, don't get me wrong, there were elements of this fight that were objectively awful, and yet, the parts involving the moral battle between Honoka, Pissard, and then later Nagisa did do a nice job establishing the uncompromising morality of our superheroines that would be carried on by all of the Precure to come. In that sense, and in spite of how cheesy that dialogue was, it was still an important building block to this franchise, even if the presentation wasn't the greatest. Anyway, after serving what would be the shortest tenure of an evil general before the boomer stole it, Pissard left behind a trinket. With the Naruwa of the Dragon Balls, I mean Prism Stones in their collection, our protagonist needed something called the Prism Hopfish to properly store it in, which Meppo was supposed to have, but... Okay, screw the Zakenda, that fairy is the scariest thing in the show. They at least managed to narrow their search down to a specific lake in the mountains, where rather comedically, they fell into a tree and then later almost botched up rescuing a baby bear. 
Honestly, I'm just surprised this wasn't Yoshimi Narita's first episode based off the rate of slapdick in just these first few scenes. Seriously, there's actually a lot of really well thought out and time humor in this one that does feel like stuff that she would later write for this franchise, so it does make me wonder how much of an influence the head writer Ryo Kawasaki had on her. Anyway, at the same time, the next of the generals was dispatched to deal with the Precure, as well as probably Stallone along the way. Said superheroines reunited the baby bear with its mother, and yeah, I'm pretty sure they should be dead, but this is one of those friendly bears that required an evil general to actually become feral. Though to be fair, it did make for one of the most epic of entrances in the show. <laughs> <laughs> Skeletor and his big kitty wish they could make an entrance like this. Anyway, the resulting fight was at least better than the last, if only because we actually got to see how Honoka fought back by using some amateur Aikido. Then the fact that she also admitted that she's not the athletic type helped to define her as the defense to Nagisa's offense of this duel. Anyway, not wanting to hurt the Meyer Bear, they made a tactical retreat. <laughs> The two purified the Meyer Bear with a convenient new spell that they just had in their repertoire, and then tried to double down by taking out Drago with their usual finisher. It didn't really work, as he would recover later, but they did manage to find the hot fish, which just so happened to be in the rocks they blasted him into, so yeah, a bit of a rushed ending, all things considered. Still, by putting their prism stone in, they were introduced to Tard, I mean Wisdom, the Guardian of the Stones. He also conveniently provided them with a diary to double up on the obvious product placement. Episode 7 focused on Nagisa actually playing some lacrosse as her team were competing at a league tournament. Honoka also assured her that she'd be there to cheer her on, but didn't mention that the senpai that Nagisa was trying to get to notice her would also be there with her. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, this dude is a total meathead, but I kind of love him. Predictably, this would all turn out to just be a big misunderstanding, but until then, Nagisa's head wasn't totally in the game, and they lost. Fortunately, I guess it was a double elimination tournament, so they had one more chance to rebound against a different team at the next game. Though until then, both girls had to deal with some complicated emotions from not being able to work out their ships properly. <laughs> Stop playing that music! Besides, this show was already giving us some strong subtext as the two spoke after the game. And again, I appreciate how this anime doesn't handhold the viewers through it and just lets them interpret Nagisa's awkwardness for themselves. As just through some good direction and writing, we could really pick up on Nagisa's apprehensiveness over having Honoka around and yet not having the courage to ask her about Senpai out of fear that it might affect their relationship that both parties had a hard time defining. Anyway, after a really nicely done time transition, again, great direction this episode, Nagisa and her teammates saw their opponents. <laughs> oh come on Nagisa, don't be like that. I mean, next thing you're gonna tell me is that this kid who looks and sounds like Bumby isn't in the fourth grade. Though fortunately, Nagisa wouldn't be distracted by Senpai this time, though a much louder and beefier distraction was approaching the stadium in the form of Drago. Wanting to ensure that the game would go on without any issues, Honoka tried to deal with him alone, again proving that this seemingly meek little bookworm was by far the gutsier and also more hothead of the two. However, Nagisa quickly noticed that her associate was gone and thus quickly joined her to deal with the brute. In the process, she also ended up being tailed by the Vice Principal Kometsuki and okay, I can kind of let slide him not recognizing Nagisa and Honoka in their pre-cure forms in spite of them not wearing anything to conceal their faces, but dude, you're not going to ask about the roided out 20 foot giant punching holes into the ground? Yeah, you know, you kind of deserve to be turned into a Zakenna. As a result, he might have become the strongest adversary of the Precure ever if you don't like listening to an old man yell at clouds. Hey, scoot over dude, I like a good roast too. But yeah, honestly, this is one of my favorite quote-unquote fights of the early part of this anime, if only for Honoka's accusatory glare here that is just amazing. Moreover, at least they pulled out their finisher after things turned in their favor when Drago hit his own monster after it started going full Karen mode in his face. And somehow, KOing him also purified the vice principal. Uh, yeah, didn't you all get a new purification spell in the last episode? Not even gonna bring it up? Okay. 
Anyway, as the two were racing back to the stadium, as the game was still on, Nagisa managed to clear things up with Honoka, who revealed that Senpai was actually her childhood friend, which in any other franchise would almost guarantee a ship, but for Precure, um... Nope. But yeah, to Honoka, Senpai was more like an older brother, and while that's also not a total denial in anime, it was enough for Nagisa as she led her team to a comeback win. Still, I guess the cockening was a decade away, so we still had to deal with a bit of a love triangle, though I think we all know how this is going to turn out. <laughs> Hey! You two should kiss! However, things just kept getting awkward between the three, with again some really nice subtle direction hinting at how Nagisa, deep down, was actually the far more reserved of the two girls, while Honoka was almost like a typical shonen protagonist based on how sociable she was. I think a strong theme that this series, and May that followed it, was the dismantling of preconceived notions. Basically, they really explored the idea of not judging a book by its cover, and in turn encouraged the target audience to find different facets of themselves. These characters could discover other interests or hobbies that don't seem to match up with their initial tropes, and yet make sense from an IRL standpoint, as sometimes humans are just that unpredictable, and more importantly, we're never truly stagnant with our development. Men sure, while these sorts of character arcs aren't anything new to fiction in general, it's still a strong storytelling tool that this franchise has used effectively over the years. I think that's the main reason I don't care for more modern series like Delicious Party, because not only do they overemphasize those tropes, but they hardly grow beyond them. Not only does it become a major hindrance for character development, <coughs> but it also, ironically in Delicious Party's case, makes the show in general more stale. Hell, even if I'm not the biggest fan of certain other seasons of this franchise, I can still say that those characters didn't feel stagnant or held back by their tropes. People tend to remember this OG for supposedly dismantling some old magical girl tropes by bringing in more CQC than usual, but really, I think it should be more praised for how it approached developing its characters. This episode in particular really explored these themes as Honoka again kind of acted like a shonen protagonist and just offhandedly introduced Nagisa to Senpai, who will switch to calling Fuji P as I think we've run that gag into the ground. But yeah, like many an insensitive protag, she ended up sowing discourse with her partner as she accidentally revealed that Nagisa was kind of stalking him. Now note, I do say insensitive and not dense as that is more of a harem protagonist thing, and besides, Honoka was trying to interact with Nagisa based on the evidence that was presented to her. From her perspective, Nagisa was incredibly sociable, being able to interact with anyone, and always seemed to show genuine interest in getting to know Fuji P. However, she was also insensitive to the smaller key details, like the fact that Nagisa mostly interacted with girls and did show signs of being hesitant of being her childhood friend. Granted, Lil Miss Lacrosse here didn't help matters by not just being honest, so both parties are kind of at fault here. And again, I really like how they're playing around with these preconceived notions, as they have led to Honoka's little misunderstanding, as well as the first big breakup moment of this franchise, that unlike others, I think has been built up over these past few episodes incredibly well, and thus has a lot more impact to it. This is such good shit! Also, it's worth mentioning that this episode was directed by Ojamajo Duran series director Takuya Igarashi, so on top of some amazing cinematography, we also got some of his random visual gags. God, that head thing is still creepy. <laughs> anyway, Honoka handed over Mipple to Nagisa, believing that she should try to find a partner who was at least an actual friend. The fairy herself suggested Nagisa try to relieve her issues by writing in their magical little diary. Uh-huh. Okay. I'll tell her. Uh, hey Nagisa, Prince Celestia is saying stop spamming her. Anyway, things were still awkward between the two the next day, with Honoka avoiding Nagisa and okay, I heard that volleyball is meant to be symbolic of the two not being able to talk to each other, or someone is playing in the classroom. Not helping matters was Drago who combined himself with a tree Zakena because he could just do that now. Though thankfully we didn't get any evil dead scenes, but instead... Just f already! We also got some nice bits of Sakuga from Katsumi Tamagai returning since episode 1. 
It was unfortunately a little too short, but it was kind of made up for it thanks to that argument that made for a good character bit between the two superheroines who finally acknowledged that they were total opposites, which appropriately made their facial even stronger as, well, they do say, opposites do attract. And even if they were fundamentally different in a lot of areas, after accidentally taking and reading each other's diaries, they realized they also wanted a lot of the same things. Most notably, to be true friends with the other. With that, the episode ended with the two making up the next day, as well as one of the more underappreciated moments of this franchise these days, and yet also one of the most important, the heroines referring to each other by first name. The following episode also focused on an argument between the main characters, though while the dynamic between Nagisa and Honoka was actually kind of complex and interesting, this one featured... Meppo. And there was much rejoicing. Yeah, I think honestly, Nagisa's little brother Ryota best summed up here when he somehow broke the fourth wall. Also, didn't bring it up, but god, this kid's voice does not match that design at all. You should receive your burgers in six to eight weeks. Anyway, Nagisa, understandably, decided to tune her partner out even as he claimed he was feeling under the weather. Though for once, he wasn't being a drama queen and was running a fever. And while she did have a card that could fix him right up... <laughs> Boy, how things have changed over the years. Legit, they really should have done it a lot sooner for safety and convenience reasons. But yeah, as for why he was sick, there was actually a surprisingly plausible reason, as Earth's environment was significantly different than their homeworld, and thus he was hit by an environmental illness like a wild animal that can't survive outside of its natural habitat. And I really like sensible little details like this that do help to ground this otherwise very over-the-top show. <laughs> Eh, you weren't totally wrong, Nagisa. I mean, yeah, just ignoring him wasn't ideal, but at the same time, this obnoxious little putz has done little to enamor himself to you, and certainly not the audience. Just saying, there's a reason these two place relatively low on the popularity polls. But yeah, this conflict was kind of weak, as Meppo's done very little to actually feel like he deserves any amount of attention, where he's caused more trouble than anything else. Anyway, because of outdated practices that really shouldn't be allowed to confiscate expensive items overnight, Nagisa tried to use a few disguises to sneak into the faculty room. First as a ramen shop worker, picking up their takeoff bowls, which yeah, is a thing when you order ramen in Japan, very environmentally friendly by the way, and then later as I guess a Konozama worker. Neither disguise worked, though not because anyone barred to question why both workers sounded and looked like one of their students. Fortunately, they later managed to get some dirt about the vice principal and how he confiscated items to cover up the fact that he just wanted to confiscate manga for himself. Dude, imagine that. A person of authority abusing their position. How unrealistic. <laughs> Anyway, our heroines figured that they could hide near the offices and sneak in after Kometsky left. However, that wouldn't exactly work out. <laughs> well, that's what happens when you try to use all of your apps at once. Ow! But yeah, he decided to take it with him to get it repaired, even though he has no right to, as that might void the warranty. But hey, it's a fairy phone, so I'm sure it's no big deal. On his way out, he ran into something legit pretty damn terrifying. Seriously, I don't normally find anatomical models all that scary, but this thing's design with that bulging eye, full set of teeth, and anger mark just kind of makes it work. Anyway, it ended up chasing the precure, but I guess this model didn't include a brain in it. Speaking of which, Struggle was not too surprisingly behind all of this as he was trying to take Metball. <laughs> Um, how did that thing hand it off to you? You know what, never mind, don't answer that. However, in a surprisingly humanizing moment for the big log, Drago felt kind of bad Meppo was sick. More importantly, he realized that dead fairy would be useless to him, so he returned him to Nagisa to get treated. However, in an equally surprising moment of stupidity from Honoka of all characters, she just blurred out that they could fight him now, even though Meppo hadn't been treated yet. Yeah, you did have to go full shonen protag there, girl. Then again, they probably needed one specific protag right about now. 
yeah, I think we all know what should be played here. Fortunately, the Colossal Zakenna was just a clumsy mook which made Drago an easy target in a very brief fight. And I didn't mind this as one, it did give it some great comedy, plus there was justification as Meppo's fever was transferring to his user, which again is an interesting little detail that establishes a weakness for our superheroines. That said, if we don't get a pre-cure and AOT crossover anytime soon, then I will be sorely disappointed. Come on, even Sinful Gear got in on that. Anyway, our superheroines blackmail Kometsuki into giving Meppo back after they patched the little turn up. I'm ramming up your butt! Episode 10 introduced us to Honoka's parents. The two were very successful art dealers who as a part of their job had to be away from Japan for extended periods, but did always make sure to make time for at least one day of the year their daughter's birthday. It was cute and you could read into the subtext that they did feel bad that they had left their daughter with just her grandmother almost year round. Sure, that trolley full of gifts could be seen as a typical rich brat's tribute, but I see them more as them trying to make up for not being able to buy her anything while they're gone. Though on that note, Nagisa, just having learned about her new BFF's birthday, was scrambling to find a gift. Oh, that's not true. I mean, you could always buy her some BuzzFeed stock. And this joke is probably going to age real quick. Back with Honoka, her parents ended up needing to go to a meeting at a fancy jewelry store. Not wanting to just leave their daughter on her birthday, they took her with them. However, things would get a little complicated when... Uh. Is that a rabbit in your pocket or you just happy to see me? Yeah, not at all surprisingly, these numbnuts were just posers who in any other situation probably would have been easily taken out by store security. But I guess the plot has to happen. Anyway, the discount wet bandits ended up missing Konaka, who did the typical superheroine thing and just asked why the bad guys were doing bad things. And their answer was pretty damn straightforward and honestly I think the tick did the scene better. We thought we'd steal a lot of money and then we'd be rich and we wouldn't have to work anymore. This did at least lead into another awesome moment, god Nuxa, you really need to start playing catch up, where she lectured the robbers. By the way, if you couldn't tell by some of the goofier aspects of this episode, this is indeed Yoshimi Narita's first contribution of many to this franchise. And don't worry, it's only gonna get better from here. Case in point, Drago arrived looking for the prism stones in an awesomely hilarious bit where he pried open the reinforced doors and then closed them back up as a courtesy. From there, Honoka again used her most powerful weapon, her words, and tricked him into believing that the stones were hidden amongst the many jewels in the store. Granted, I feel really bad for the owners who are going to have to front some massive repair bells, but whatever, it bought them time. However, they were left shanghai as these robbers were somehow both incredibly incompetent and yet master thieves who managed to cut the lines and break the shutters like, seriously, is there no security at this jewelry store? Yeah, as we'd see, this is definitely some of the early stages of Narita, where she didn't put a lot of her stats into setting details. Fortunately, she does put a lot into her character building, as while their initial motivations were super on the nose, the robbers quickly revealed a surprisingly relatable backstory. They were the unfortunate fall boys of a defunct company with the president having dumped all of their deaths onto them. An all too common story that you'll likely hear a lot more of soon. Really at that point, even an ill-conceived jewelry heist would at least be a cool way to go out. Well, look at that, the OG proving that you can indeed quote a parental figure without sounding like a platitude spouting ninny. Anyway, Honoka's father managed to alert the police which gave his daughter and Mippo an opportunity to get Nagisa's attention through the news. Said secondary maid character, seriously Honoka's done most of the legwork in the show, was in the middle of making a clay figurine present for her partner, I'm guessing the stuff was left over from Ojama Shotoremi. But yeah, again, because no one bothers to pay attention these days, Nagisa managed to get into the police sealed off store through the vents. Your tax dollars at work, folks. Whatever, it made for an awesome entrance, with the two transforming, as fortunately no one was, or rather, could watch. And everyone died. The end.
Nah, that's what should have happened based on how freaking strong this guy was. But they survived and turned themselves over to the police, which considering that they'll also likely be charged for all of the damages Drago caused, yeah, maybe death would have been easier. As for how the Precure defeated Drago, well, interestingly, their light-based finisher was amplified thanks to the reflective surfaces of the jewels. Again, I really like little details like this that managed to make a lot of sense even though they tried to overcomplicate it later. The last episode we'll cover for today featured Nagisa and her little brother going through the most noticeable puberty ever. But yeah, the elder sibling ended up getting forced into taking him to the aquarium for a school assignment, much to her objections. Precure, the franchise that used to encourage putting your siblings into submission holds. Personally, I go more for the sharpshooter myself. Meanwhile, Drago wasn't getting much better treatment from his cohorts, and especially not his boss, who gave him the good old ultimatum. But hey, I'm sure unlike Pissard, he ain't going anywhere, especially after only- Oh wait, you already got one more episode than him. Well, this dude's toast, and he didn't even get to beat Rocky this time. Anyway, the Preaky and Ryota were checking out, I honestly think, a little more variety of sea creatures than even Tropical Rouge, or at least more unique ones. Oh hey look, it's Lara! At the same time, Drago managed to sneak in, very discreetly. Yeah, brah, you might be a better swimmer if you stop skipping leg day. Anyway, he launched an attack and used the entire aquarium as his catalyst. Again, the Zakenda summons are awesomely OP in the show, especially when they can do stuff like this. <laughs> I mean, it looks way more realistic than Jaws 3D. But yeah, it was a pretty intense situation as all of the residents of Bikini Bottom took over the aquarium, with even the more immobile fish being able to move around. It could be worse, at least they don't have legs. To protect her brother, Nagisa had Ryota to hide while they dealt with the obvious culprit, who, on top of being an obvious fan of nostalgic films, also revealed who his favorite Kamen Rider villain was. <laughs> <laughs> now you see, this is what happens when you put the blue medals in the wrong order. Actually, isn't Mezu standing right there? No, so yeah, maybe it is a combination of my love for Kamen Rider O's and Jaws, but I kind of like this monster design, even if it is a little extra. I mean, the shark mouth face is at least objectively awesome. Anyway, the fight with him start off with just some okay animation. I mean, we have progressed since the beginning of the series, but it was still missing that little extra flair to really put it over the top. Oh, I know, why don't we throw in a sibling in danger? Yeah, like the little lemming he was, Ryota went against his sister's orders and went to where the danger clearly was. Granted, I understand why he did, as he was worried about his sister, and they at least did give Nagisa her much needed big moment after Honaka got the bulk of focus in these first episodes. I mean, she just went to town on this guy with some great animation by Yoshikazu Tomita, who also has provided some of the better visuals of the show so far, including the transformation sequence. And Isakuga was definitely needed to get across Nagisa taking after her VA's former savior. <laughs> But yeah, this is one of the best early examples of the undying resolve of the Precure that can arise from within when the time is right. I mean, let's face it, Nagisa has been more of an observer to the events around her, especially at the beginning, and yet as time has gone on, and she's gotten to know her allies, as well as had things become a little more personal, she was able to awaken her inner superheroine who won't stand by idly while others were in danger. It is a bit of a basic premise for many a superhero, but I do like how this show executed it very gradually, without rushing into it, or just forgetting about it outright. Also, really nice touch changing up the finisher by switching out Nagisa's usual frames with ones of her crying and adding a bit of her visibly tightening her grip with Honoka reacting to it. Again, really good visual storytelling showing both Nagisa's anger and determination and Honoka's willingness to help her friend even if she did get a little hurt in the process. And with that, we did unfortunately have to say farewell to the big steroid monger, but at least our superheroines got a new stone in the process. <laughs> The manufacturers still need more time to make an actually good toy. I mean, we're not a sweatshop working business that pumps out cheap products every other week. Yet. And with that, this episode and the Geki Drago arc ended with things not really changing between the Misumi siblings, other than I think Nagisa's grip got tighter, both to protect her little brother and to straighten her lock. 
These first 11 episodes were a lot of fun to look back on, both for nostalgia and to see how much and how little things have changed over the years. In the case of The Farmer, it does unfortunately feel like some of the new writers have lost their appreciation for visual storytelling like this, which is hopefully going to change in 2023. But yeah, the fact that even the opening recaps didn't feel intrusive goes to show how proper structuring can really help out a show's storytelling and flow. Granted, there was a reason why things needed to flow as well as it did, as well as why two generals were defeated after just 11 episodes that we'll explain next time, but yeah, it did end up having the effect that every encounter with them felt significant. Sure, it was obvious they were going to lose, but there was always a threat to them helped by the fact that to this day, the Sakenna remain one of the most unique monsters of the week just for their sheer versatility. Meanwhile, Nyx and Honoka prove why they're going back to the dual format for the next series. After all, when a show is just focused on two main characters, it allows the viewers to compare and contrast them more, and in turn read more into their characters. With that in mind, the writers did a good job giving some surprising layers that even went against some of the first impressions a viewer might get from them. And overall, this was a very solid start to the series, in spite of some of the more disappointing conclusions to some rather short fights, which yeah, has always kind of been a thing with this franchise, hasn't it? But still, there is another core ahead of us where things will start to take a turn as more memorable stories and villains await. But yeah, hopefully by the time this goes up, it will be December 31st, which will make this the last video of 2022 for this channel. And I gotta say, it's been a pretty productive year. I mean, after the pandemic, things can only run smoother, but this channel has grown decently, and we've even built up a little bit of a community thanks to those who come to watch our weekly premieres. We also started tackling this whole shorts thing, which I did shy away from as I found them to be a little lame and fatty, but if they let us get something out that I don't want to write a whole 20 plus script for, then I'll consent. Though, as for what y'all can look forward to in 2023, well, we might tackle some new stuff for both this main and secondary channel, depending on how things pan out, mostly in regards to how that meddlesome little copyright bot will react. Still, do at least expect some more countdowns, as well as looks into some more obscure Magical Girl subject matter. Look forward to all of that, and until then though, for our finale fans, and if you excuse me, I've got a little reading to do.